Um, so I, I'm going to talk about sleep, which is something that my lab has been studying for the past decade or so. And in my mind, there are really two big questions about sleep. How do we sleep and why do we sleep? And today I hope to touch upon both questions. So sleep is an essential innate behavior. Um, so we know how to sleep uh, actually before birth uh, in our mother's wombs. So this is a behavior that does not require learning at all. And as far as we know, all animals sleep, uh, mammals, birds, uh, fish, flies, and even jellyfish, right? So these organisms are very simple. They don't even have a central nervous system. And yet they even uh, exhibit some sleep-like behavior. And if we're deprived of sleep completely, we die quickly. So for all the non-mammalian animals, uh, sleep is detected exclusively based on a lack of movement. Um, so for example, flies, uh, they're used as a good model system to study sleep. And I know that Amita Segal came last month, so she studies flies. So for flies, if you want to score a sleep episode, the fly has to stay still for five minutes minimum. And so that's called a sleep episode. And if you apply gentle sensory stimulation, they should show no motor response. But the readout is entirely motor, right? Do they move or not? For mammalian uh, uh, animal models like uh, mice, we usually measure EEG and EMG. So the EMG measures somatic motor activity, a skeletal muscle tone, and you can see that it's clearly reduced during sleep. And then based on EEG, we can distinguish uh, rapid eye movement, REM sleep, and non-REM sleep. So generally, you can see that during REM sleep, uh, the EEG looks kind of similar to wakefulness, right? There's a lack of high amplitude, low frequency activity. So this kind of desynchronized EEG is generally thought to be associated with vivid conscious experience, either of the outside world when you're awake or REM sleep when you experience vivid dreaming. But the synchronized EEG, uh, this kind of you know, uh, large amplitude, low frequency activity, is associated with, with either dull or absence of conscious experience. Then for humans, in addition to EEG and EMG, we also measure, uh, say, heartbeats and breathing. So these are controlled by the autonomic motor system, and they also slow down during sleep. So falling asleep is not just about changing the conscious experience or brain state that you can measure with EEG. It's also about reduction of somatic motor activity and autonomic motor activity. So when my lab got into the sleep field a decade ago, uh, our main obsession was the question of how do we sleep? And what we discovered over the years is that the neurons in our brain that put us to sleep are really part of the motor circuits controlling either somatic motor activity or autonomic motor activity. So for example, here is a circuit diagram for somatic motor control. Uh, so this blue box here is the uh, basal ganglia. We know it's important for movement control. That's you know, where things go wrong in Parkinson's disease. So now we know that there are sleep neurons in all the regions circled in red. So you can see that it's pretty much every level of this network. And here is a circuit diagram for autonomic cardiovascular control. And we have found sleep neurons in all these regions. Again, pretty much every level. So this is really the take home message. Uh, we call it the motor theory, that sleep is controlled by distributed networks of neurons that are really part of the motor network for either autonomic or uh, somatic motor control. So now, if the rest of my talk puts you in the sleep, uh, in the state that I'm talking about, it's OK, as long as you remember this take home message. OK, so a little bit of background. Um, pioneered by Maruzi and Magoon, who discovered the uh, ascending arousal system, we know a lot about the neurons that wake us up. So for example, these include a lot of the monoamine neurons, uh, let's say noigenergic neurons in locus julius, dopaminergic neurons, uh, serotonin neurons, and, and uh, histaminergic neurons. Also some cholinergic neurons, and some peptidergic neurons, like the orexin neurons. Um, the search for the mechanism for sleep control 
really started uh, in the modern version about 100 years ago. After the last really, really big pandemic, uh, that was the Spanish flu, right, 100 years ago. Um, so Von Economo discovered that a subset of the patients uh, who tend to show severe insomnia, uh, they have lesions in this region of the brain. So this is called the preoptic area or POA. So this is part of the hypothalamus. And then later, this was confirmed by experiments in animals. So you can create lesions in animals, and that confirms that the POA is important for sleep. So that led to the idea uh, that the standard model that's written in all the textbooks, that the POA is the sleep center uh, in the mammalian brain. And the idea is that the POA uh, promotes sleep by inhibiting a lot of these wake-promoting neurons that we know about. And indeed, using retrograde uh, labeling and gene profiling, we were able to identify a subset of the POA neurons that promote sleep. But it turns out that this wasn't the whole story. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, we have accidentally stumbled upon some neurons pretty far from the POA that powerfully promote sleep. And there were also some reports from other labs showing you know, non-POA neurons that promote sleep. So that suggests that perhaps sleep is controlled not by a single center. And to get an idea of what the entire sleep network might look like, we decided to do a whole brain screening for sleep neurons. So we have two basic criteria. Uh, one is that they need to be sleep promoting. So if you activate these cells, that should increase sleep. And if you inactivate them, that should decrease sleep. The second one is that they should be uh, sleep active so that they need to be uh, active at the right time uh, to do their job. And we also have two corresponding strategies to screen for sleep neurons. We could either screen for sleep promoting neurons or screen for sleep active neurons. And so today I'm just gonna focus on the first strategy. So we did this based on an incredibly simple logic. So the idea is that we know a lot about the wake neurons, right? The neurons that wake us up. So we're gonna start with those and then use retrograde tracing to find their presynaptic inhibitory inputs. Because we know that sleep and wake are mutually exclusive. So if you're awake, you can't be asleep, and if you're asleep, you can't be awake. So if you have a neuron that inhibits the wake promoting neurons, then perhaps that neuron can promote sleep. And then once we find these inhibitory sleep neurons, we're gonna trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. Because if you have a neuron that can excite a whole bunch of neurons that promote sleep, then perhaps that neuron is a sleep neuron. So when I came up with this idea, um, say seven or eight years ago, I thought it was just way too simple to get us very far. But in fact, it worked out remarkably well. Uh, in fact, beyond my wildest imagination. So I'm just gonna show you an example of that. So this was done by Chen Yan Ma, a really talented postdoc in my lab. So Chen Yan targeted a whole bunch of wake-promoting neurons uh, and then looked for brain regions with broad GABAergic innervation of them because GABA is inhibitory. So here is a list of the wake neurons that she targeted, uh, including some histaminergic neurons, noradrenergic neurons, and glutamatergic and cholinergic neurons. And here is a list of the brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic innervation. So these bars indicate the amount of GABAergic innervation. So you can see that this list uh, includes the POA, right? So this is the textbook sleep center. But to our surprise, the top candidate that came out of this is actually the CEA, which is the central nucleus of the amygdala. So for the sake of time, I won't show you the data, but Chen Yan was able to identify a subset of the CEA neurons that are both sleep active and sleep promoting. And today I'm gonna to focus on this third candidate region, which is the SNR, substantia nigra pars reticulata. So some of you might know that this is actually the output region of the basal ganglia, right? So we all know it's important for uh, motor control. And yet it sort of came out of our screening for uh, sleep neurons. So we decided to, oh sorry, so I should say that this was characterized by Dan Chen Liu, a former postdoc in my lab. So we decided to uh, also look at the motor behavior of these mice. So in addition to EEG and EMG, we also uh, put up a video recording for the motor behavior. 
and our collaborators in Beijing helped us to use deep learning to train the convoluted neural network, convolutional neural network for image segmentation. And we were able to extract two simple parameters of their motor activity. One is translation and the other is total movement. And when we plotted these two parameters uh, in this two-dimensional space, we found three clusters. Uh, the dark green cluster uh, corresponds to locomotion, right? So for mice, they don't, unlike humans, running is basically the, their biggest movement. And then uh, the lighter green is all the other smaller movements, including uh, eating, grooming, and some postural adjustment. And the gray cluster is basically e-mobility. And yet, if we look at the EEG and EMG, uh, there are actually two distinct states. One is sleep, and the other is quiet wakefulness. They are awake, but just not doing anything. So basically, we have four behavior states. So now here I'm plotting the, uh, on the left, is the EEG delta power across the four behavior states. So delta is this low frequency oscillation in the EEG. The higher the delta power, the less aroused your brain is. So the point I wanted to make here is that if you look at the three greenish states, right? So these are all wake states. This is the only sleep state. We tend to think of their difference in terms of motor activity, right? They're awake, and so they're you know, doing different things. But if you look at the EEG, there's also a systematic difference, right? When they move more, there's less delta, means that their brain is more aroused, right? So think about when you're out running, your brain is actually much more aroused than if you're sitting there not doing anything. And if you compare the, uh, the quiet wakefulness and sleep states, so both are immobility states, right? So we tend to think of their difference in terms of brain states. But if you look at the EMG, there's also a very clear difference. So the example of that is that if you're sitting upright like now, and if you fall asleep, the first thing you do is to nod off. And that's because you lose your muscle tone at the neck muscle, right? So the point is that brain state measured by EEG and motor states measured by EMG are correlated across multiple behavior states, right? So these two tend to co-vary. OK, and when we looked at the transitions uh, across these four states, uh, they tend to um, change in a systematic way. So if the mice start out running, this is locomotion, they always transition into non-locomotor movement. We have never seen the case where the mouse was like running one moment and then bam, just fall asleep the next, the next moment, right? Just like humans we kind of gradually wind down before we go to sleep. And if they you know, start out doing other movement, they either go back to running or into quiet wakefulness. So if we put these four states uh, in a single chain, one dimensional chain, then most of the transitions, these arrows, are between neighboring states, right? Rarely they jump across states. So what this means is that basically both brain arousal and motor states tend to change gradually rather than abruptly, right? So that's the other thing that we learned. OK, so all of this is just behavior. And what about the SNR neurons? It turns out that there are actually two subtypes of GABAergic neurons uh, in the SNR. Uh, one type expresses this uh, calcium binding protein called parvalbumin. So they tend to sit in the lateral SNR. And the other types, the PV negative cells, but they express the GABAergic marker GAT2. They tend to be in the medial SNR. So next, we wanted to record from these cells and see you know, if they're active during sleep or wakefulness. And the way we do that is to tag these cells with channel dopsin. And then during recording, we use uh, this thing called optrode. Basically, it's an optic fiber surrounded by a bunch of electrodes. And so, for example, here is a one uh, recorded unit. And you can see that every time we turn on the uh, laser briefly, uh, this little blue dot, 10 milliseconds, uh, it evoked a spiking pretty reliably at a very short latency. So we think that this is a neuron that expresses channel dopsin, therefore it's a GAT2 neuron in this mouse. And so once we identify a cell like that, we just look at the spontaneous activity. So here you can see the EEG and EMG, and here's a firing rate of one identified cell. So this cell, the firing rate tends to be pretty high during non-REM sleep, uh, the orange region. 
and lower uh, in these green states, so when the animal uh, is running or, or moving. So here's a summary, right? So the GA2 neurons, this magenta line, uh, these neurons tend to be most active during sleep and least active during the biggest movement, which is running. But the PV cells tend to have the opposite um, trend. So the PV cells are not sleep active, but the GA2 cells seem to be sleep active. So this is one of our two criteria. And then when we optogenetically activated these cells, so our standard protocol is to turn on the laser for two minutes per trial. And so this is what we call the laser triggered average. And this actually came from my vision days in the sleep field. Nobody did this uh, until we, we got in and people started doing it. So I'm very proud of it. Um, so you can see that as soon as we turn on the laser at time zero, right? So laser is this blue shading here. Within seconds, you see a huge reduction of locomotion, other movements, and even quiet wake. And there's a corresponding increase in sleep. But PV neuron activation has very little effect. When we inactivated the GA2 cells, we increased the movement and decreased sleep. And again, PV cells have very little effect. So the conclusion is that the GA2, but not the PV cells, um, that are sleep active and their activation suppress, uh, suppresses movement and enhances sleep. Right. So these are both sleep active and sleep promoting. So even though they suppress one thing, like they suppress movement and enhance sleep, this is not caused by direct transition from movement to sleep. So here, remember I showed this diagram uh, in a natural states, right? So they, most of the transitions are between neighboring states. And during optogenetic activation of the GA2 neurons, we don't create any transitions that we don't normally observe under the natural situation. Instead, what the uh, laser does is to bias the direction of the natural transitions. So all the red ones are enhanced by laser, and the blue ones are suppressed by laser. So basically, all the downward transitions are enhanced by laser. So basically, right, so we're just kind of pushing the animal down the chain. Now, again, I want to sort of digress a little bit, right? So if you think about if you're a neuroscientist and you say, I turn on the laser and I enhance the transition from running to other movements, you would say, hey, I found some neurons that control movement. So we call that motor control. And if the laser causes termination of movements into quiet wakefulness, you would say that's motor control. But if you see transition from quiet wakefulness to sleep, all in a sudden, you say that's brain state control, right? But in fact, all of these transitions are associated with both the EEG brain state change and the motor change, right? And these neurons really don't care what we call these transitions. They just do whatever they do, depending on where the, the animal was. The laser is just going to push the animal down the chain one step at a time. In other words, sleep is really just the last stop in this gradual transition, right, with a gradual reduction of motor activity um, and brain arousal. And when we did the inactivation through this inhibitory option, we basically um, bias the transitions uh, in the upward direction. OK, so next we wanted to see where uh, do these neurons project to. So the PV neurons, uh, they project to the motor uh, uh, part of the thalamus, the motor layers of the superior colliculus. And this region, people call it the mesocephalic something, locomotor region. So this region controls uh, running. And so all of these are very well known. But if you look at the GA2 neurons, in addition to these motor areas, they also project to the dorsal raphe, which contains both serotonin neurons and uh, dopamine neurons that are important for brain arousal. They also project to the locus ceruleus with noradrenergic neurons, again, for brain arousal. So in other words, they project to both the motor regions and the brain arousal regions. And when we use the virus trick to label the neurons that project to the motor regions, we also see their axon collaterals. Uh, in the brain arousal regions, and vi vice versa. So that indicates that the same neuron, they send axon collaterals to motor control regions and the brain arousal regions. So we think that this is important because that allows these neurons to coordinate uh, the two changes. 
Okay, so now we found a population of GABAergic sleep neurons, and we're going to trace one more step back and look for the excitatory input. And so this is actually very well known in the basal ganglia field. A, a very strong uh, excitatory input to the SNR comes from the subthalamic nucleus, STN. And when we activated the STN neurons, we also saw an increase in non-REM sleep, this orange line, and decrease in wakefulness. Okay. So um, I just told you a story, right, about neurons involved in both somatic motor control and brain state control. But like I said, for humans, at least we know that there's also autonomic motor change during sleep. So now I'm going to spend a couple minutes telling you about an autonomic circuit. So that's a circuit involved in cardiovascular barrel reflex. Um, so barrel reflex is a simple negative feedback loop. The idea is that any increase in the blood pressure uh, sensed by some barrel receptors, that signal is going to be transmitted to the medulla, the brainstem, and that's going to trigger a number of changes in the heart and blood vessels to stabilize the blood pressure. So the circuit is actually quite well understood. Uh, there are base, uh, two basic pathways. Uh, one of them is the excitatory projection from the solitary tract nucleus to this region called the ambiguous nucleus, uh, both in the medulla. And the ambiguous nucleus contains cholinergic neurons that are part of the parasympathetic system that slows down the heart. The other pathway is the excitation from the solitary tract to this region called the CVLM, caudal ventrolateral medulla. So these are the GABAergic neurons that actually inhibit the RVLM, which contains uh, adrenergic neurons that are part of the sympathetic uh, output pathway. So basically, both pathways, uh, the activation causes activation of the parasympathetic system and inhibition of the sympathetic system. So this was characterized by Yuan Yuan Yao, uh, another postdoc in my lab. So the first thing that Yuan Yuan did was to um, isolate the solitary tract neurons that are sensitive to um, blood pressure, because the solitary tract is really it's a mixture of a lot of things uh, receiving the vagus nerve uh, input. So the way that she did this was to use a technique called the false trap developed by Li Chun Luo's lab. So the idea is that you cross two mouse lines together. Uh, one expresses Cre-ER under the false promoter. So false is activated by activity. So any neuron that's activated is going to express Cre-ER, and you cross that with a dependent expression of a fluorescent marker. So in this case, you can see that uh, Yuan Yuan uh, injected this drug called phenylephrine, uh, PE, which acts on the smooth muscles to increase the blood pressure. And so you can see a BP increase and a corresponding heart rate decrease. So that activates the barrel reflex. And here you can see that um, uh, PE injection uh, allowed us to trap a lot of the neurons in the solitary tract compared to saline control. So these are presumably the neurons that are activated by blood pressure increase. So the next thing she did was to try to validate and see if these neurons are indeed barosensitive. And so she again tagged these neurons with channel adoption. Um, so here you can see an example. Uh, this is a mouse running free in the home cage. So you can see that the blood pressure is fluctuating, and so is the heart rate. And here's the firing rate of that cell. And you can see that the firing rate correlates with the blood pressure quite well. So that suggests that this neuron uh, is sensitive to blood pressure. And when we zoomed in temporally, we can see that a subset of these cells are actually time-locked to individual heartbeats. Right? So that suggests that these neurons are also sensitive to the blood pressure fluctuations within uh, individual cardiac cycles. So all of these are just saying that these neurons are indeed barosensitive, right? They're part of the cardiovascular system. So next, Yuan Yuan uh, activated these cells optogenetically. So basically, she turned on the laser for two minutes per trial every 10, 15 minutes or so. And here's a summary of the data. So within seconds after she turned on the laser, you can see a very dramatic drop in the blood pressure and the heart rate. So this is consistent with the expected role of these cells in cardiovascular control. But you can also see a slower but consistent increase in non-REM sleep and decrease in wakefulness. Right? So these cells, in addition to cardiovascular control, 
they also have a second job, a second job in uh, regulating brain state. And then Yuan Yuan looked at the downstream projections of these cells. So first, she activated the CVLM garbaging neurons, uh, and then that also caused an increase in uh, non-REM sleep. We think that this is partly mediated by their inhibition of the RVLM cells because direct inhibition of the RVLM cells also cause an increase in sleep. And conversely, if you inactivate the CVLM cells, that increase wakefulness. And the same thing is true if you directly activate the RVLM adrenergic cells. So in fact, this last experiment was just a repetition of something that was already published a few years ago by an, another lab. And in that paper, they actually figured out that the reason why the RVLM cells promote wakefulness is because they actually send excitation to the locus ceruleus, right, which is known to be important for brain arousal. And also we looked at this other pathway uh, when we directly activated the ambiguous nucleus uh, cholinergic neurons. Uh, in this case, we did chemogenetic activation. Uh, we also saw an increase in non-REM sleep. So the basic conclusion of this short story is that uh, the cardiovascular barrel reflex circuit um, they have a second job. They moonlights in sleep control. So this is the cover art we made for Neuron, uh, which I think is quite beautiful. It's got moonlight and sleep and even the brain in it. <laughs> uh, but Neuron didn't take it, unfortunately. OK, so just to sum it up, um, as I said, right? so we know that during sleep, uh, there is a change in brain arousal and also reduction of somatic and autonomic motor activity. And so it kind of makes sense that uh, the sleep control mechanism should inhibit the brain arousal system and also the two motor systems. So for the somatic motor system, um, I showed you data on the STN-SNR pathway. I didn't have time to show you the data, but we also found some neurons in the thalamus that promote sleep. Now, in the brainstem, uh, we actually found a population of GABAergic neurons in the medulla that powerfully promote non-REM sleep. And Sylvia Arbor's lab um, has studied pretty much the same population, and they claim that those neurons stop movement. So that's just another example where you have the same neurons that can stop uh, movement and also promote sleep. So in the striatum, we didn't look at them, but um, Zili Huang's lab and uh, Michael Lazarus's lab have shown that uh, a subset of the neurons, so these are the so-called indirect pathway, median spiny neurons, they promote, a subset of them promote sleep as well. And we know from decades of work in the basal ganglia, the activation of those medium spiny neurons can cause activation of our SDN SNR pathways, right? So these are all part of the same circuit. So for the autonomic motor system, I showed you the data for the solitary tract and the ventral uh, lateral medulla. Uh, I didn't show the data, but we have found sleep neurons in the periaqueductal gray, the amygdala, and of course the hypothalamus. So all of these are key nodes of the central autonomic nervous system. So it seems like this textbook version uh, of sleep control with a single sleep center is quite inadequate. Uh, instead, sleep is really controlled by multiple interconnected populations of neurons that deeply uh, infiltrate both the somatic and autonomic uh, motor system. So at this point, we feel like we have a pretty good handle on the how question. Uh, and so right by the time we kind of figured this out, the pandemic hits. And so we were all locked down at home, and I was quite depressed. Um, going through my midlife crisis. And so I thought, you know, we could keep doing the same thing. And of course, there are more details to be figured out. But, you know, life is too short. Maybe it's time to do something else. Um, so we started really thinking about this why question. So we know that sleep deprivation causes a lot of problems. Uh, in addition to um, mental problems, uh, it causes immunodeficiency cardiovascular diseases, and hormone imbalances. So that suggests that sleep interacts with all of these systems. But here's a big question. Are there multiple independent processes that are supported by sleep? 
Or perhaps there's a single fundamental process that can underlie all of these interactions. So think about feeding, right? So if you're food deprived for, say, three days, you're going to have all kinds of problems. But the single fundamental purpose of feeding is the intake of energy and nutrients. So is there something like that for sleep? And if so, what could that be? So I don't have the answer to that uh, today, but I'll share with you how we're thinking about it. So from the circuit studies that I just talked about, we know that sleep is very much about uh, suppression of motor activity. And perhaps that allows uh, growth and repair of muscle cells damaged during high motor activity. Right? So for example, we know that bodybuilders, they need a lot more sleep than the rest of us. Otherwise, they don't get to grow a lot of the muscles. Um, and we also know that sleep suppresses brain arousal. And one aspect of that is the reduction of neuronal firing rates. And perhaps that allows rest and repair of neurons. But if you look at the whole brain, the overall reduction of firing rate uh, is really pretty minor. So for example, in the cortex, the reduction of firing rates of overall cortical neurons is about 20 to 30% during non-REM sleep. And during REM sleep, these neurons just go crazy, right? So some of them, firing, the firing rates are higher than uh, overall wakefulness. Uh, in the basal forebrain, we have recorded from a bunch of cell types, uh, the parvalbumin positive cells, these are GABAergic, and the glutamatergic cells, they reduce their firing rates by 20% during non-REM sleep. Somatostatin neurons are mixed, some increase, some decrease firing rates. The only exception uh, is the cholinergic neurons. So these neurons are very important for arousal, and they reduce their firing rates by 90% uh, during non-REM sleep. The other cell type uh, that's really, really suppressed by sleep is the noradrenergic neurons in the locus julius. So this is from a classic paper from uh, Gary Aston Jones, published 40 years ago. So you can see that uh, during non-REM sleep, uh, which is also called slow wave sleep, the firing rates of these cells um, are reduced by like 90% compared to wakefulness. And during REM sleep, uh, the suppression is 100%. So it seems that if we're looking for neurons that are really suppressed by sleep, we should be looking at these wake-promoting neuromodulatory systems, because the other neurons, they just don't get uh, suppressed that much. So among these neuromodulatory neurons, we're particularly intrigued by the adrenergic system, including both adrenergic and noradrenergic neurons, for several reasons. First, they regulate uh, brain arousal, uh, as I mentioned already and also somatic and autonomic nervous system. So we know that adrenaline and noradrenaline are important uh, neurotransmitters for the uh, sympathetic autonomic nervous system, right, increasing uh, heart rate and blood pressure. And they also, in addition to neurons and muscles, they also regulate metabolism and the immune system. In fact, we know that many cell types in the immune system, they express a ton of adrenergic receptors. Furthermore, these neurons are particularly vulnerable to metabolic stress. So these neurons actually die very early in both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. In fact, they degenerate earlier than even the dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease and before the cholinergic neurons in Alzheimer's disease. So one possibility is that because of such vulnerability, these neurons, they just need to shut down once in a while to rest and repair, right? And that only happens during sleep because we know that they only get shut down uh, during sleep big time. So if this is true, right, this is a, one of the main reasons for sleep, then the prediction is that these neurons cannot sustain high activity for a prolonged period of time. They just need to rest uh, uh, pretty frequently. So in other words, they fatigue quickly. So now I'm just going to spend the next five minutes or so to show you some preliminary data on the activity of adrenergic neurons and sleep pressure. So here's a simple experiment uh, done by uh, Dan uh, Silverman in my lab, a uh, postdoc in my lab. So he expressed uh, this red uh, opsin uh, reacher in the locus julius neurons, adrenergic neurons. 
And so our standard protocol, she turns on the laser to activate these cells for two minutes per trial every 10 minutes or so. And here's a summary of the data. Now, as soon as we turn on the laser, within a couple of seconds, the probability of wakefulness, this gray line, jumps to like 80 to 90 percent. So this is consistent with the powerful wake-promoting effect of these locus julius neurons. But you notice that this effect is very transient, right? So within a minute, even though we keep the laser stimulation, the probability of wakefulness has returned to baseline. And when we turn off the laser at two minutes, um, there's actually a dip below the baseline. So this suggests to us that this optogenetic activation caused a rapid increase in sleep needs. So after a minute, even though we keep the stimulation, it's harder to keep the mouse awake. And when we stop the stimulation, they sleep even more. So of course you can say, well, you know, is this unique to the LC neurons? Or perhaps the other wake-promoting neurons do the same thing. So we looked at a whole bunch of other wake-promoting neurons. So here's an example of activating some glutamatergic neurons in the ventral medulla. Uh, so in this case, blue, uh, sorry, blue is wake. Here is uh, activating the cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain, uh, gray is wake. Uh, Garbage neurons in the POA, again, gray is wake. And this is actually from uh, Viviana Gradinaro's lab at Caltech. So they activated dopaminergic neurons in the dorsal raphe. And so in this case, blue is wake. You can see that in all of these cases, the increase in wakefulness outlasts the duration of laser stimulation, right? Very different from activating the locus julius neurons. In fact, when we were searching for the sleep neurons, we just accidentally encountered so many wake-promoting neurons, and we hated those neurons because they were not what we were looking for. But we also knew that none of them acted like the LC neurons. So LC neurons are really quite unique. So next, we wanted to know what happened to these locus julius neurons uh, during laser stimulation. So first, we did calcium imaging uh, through GCAM. And so here is a recording of their activity through fiber photometry. And so you can see that these neurons are most active during wakefulness, a gray, and also somewhat active during non-REM sleep, uh, orange. And they're almost completely shut down during uh, REM sleep, uh, blue. Here's the population summary. And these are the changes at brain state transitions. You know, whenever they wake up, there's also a big jump up. And when they fall asleep, there's a decrease. So all of this is just consistent with uh, what uh, Gary Aston Jones has published uh, with electrophysiology 40 years ago. But the main purpose of this experiment is to see what happens during optogenetic activation. So here, um, uh, Dan expressed both GCAM and Reacher uh, in the LC neurons. So Reacher uh, activation requires orange light. I apologize for using green for orange light. Uh, and then for calcium imaging, uh, the excitation light is blue. So we use this little device to send uh, light of both wavelengths into the mouse LC. And because these two wavelengths are sufficiently far apart, we can do stimulation and imaging more or less independently from each other. So here, um, the, uh, each ep uh, episode of stimulation is two minutes. And within that, we apply multiple laser pulses. And hopefully you can see that a lot of these individual laser pulses evoked calcium transients. So here we're plotting the amplitude of the calcium responses to the laser stimulation. And you can see that um, there is a pretty rapid decline of the amplitude. So near the end of that two minute episode, uh, each laser evokes a smaller uh, calcium response. It's about 60% of the initial amplitude. And here's the overall calcium activity. So you can see that after the initial jump, there's a gradual decline. And then when we turn off the laser, there's actually a dip below the baseline. So that suggests that laser stimulation during these two minutes um, also caused the suppression of spontaneous activity during this period. And of course, for these neurons, what really matters is how much noradrenaline they release, because that's what uh, mediates their function. So next, we imaged a noradrenaline concentration using the grab sensor developed by uh, Yulong Li's lab. Um, so here you can see that uh, NE, uh, norepinephrine, is just another name for noradrenaline, is the highest during wakefulness, kind of lower during non-REM sleep, and the lowest during REM sleep. 
And this is the summary. So all of these are consistent with the calcium activity and the EFIS data. So here I'm plotting the uh, responses to individual laser pulses. And you can see that each laser pulse, the, the green line here, evokes a jump uh, in NE level. But the amplitude, again, declines pretty quickly. So here is the population summary. And you can see that near the end of that two-minute uh, episode, the evoked uh, NE release is less than 20% of the initial release. So this is even more dramatic than what we saw with calcium imaging. So what this suggests to us is that this kind of optogenetic activation caused a rapid fatigue of these LC neurons, so that after a few pulses, they can't do their job effectively, which is to release a lot of noradrenaline. And because we know that noradrenaline is very important for promoting arousal, we think that this kind of fatigue is one important cause for the increase in sleep pressure. So of course, at this point, we're also a little bit worried, right? Because you see this very dramatic effect. But then the question is, could this be some kind of artifact, right? It sounds like too good to be true, right? So maybe it's because our optogenetic stimulation is just non-physiological. So what Dan decided to do is to go to some naturalistic kind of stimulation. So what he did was to uh, put a mouse cage on top of a lab shaker. This is our version of biochemistry. <laughs> and so he uh, used his computer to control the shaking of the shaker, just like he used his computer to control the laser. So here is a video. Um, can you actually play the video for me? Oh, actually, it's playing. Great. So you can see that the mouse is there, and now the two seconds shaking, and then it stops. So the interval is about 10, 15 seconds. And another earthquake. Right. So you can see that the mouse is kind of like kept awake, but, but he wasn't too bothered. And so here, uh, you can see that this is our protocol, right? Each episode is two minutes, and uh, each, uh, each trial of shaking is two seconds, these blue lines. So it very much uh, parallel, uh, parallels his uh, laser stimulation protocol. So here I'm plotting the calcium responses and noradrenaline release evoked by each two-second uh, cage shaking. And again, you can sort of see this gradual decline of the amplitude. And again, the decline is much more dramatic for noradrenaline release compared to the calcium responses. And here's the effect on behavior. Uh, after this initial large increase in wakefulness, you see this gradual decline. And when we stop the cage shaking at two minutes, uh, you can see a clear rebound of sleep, first of non-REM and then REM sleep. So it seems like you know, this kind of cage shaking, which doesn't seem to be too traumatic to the mice, can also uh, evoke both LC fatigue and uh, sleep pressure. So we think that what we saw with optogenetics is not entirely an artifact. So, so those are all the data I wanted to share today. Um, we don't yet know the cellular mechanism underlying this rapid fatigability of the LC neurons, but we suspect that it's somehow linked to the vulnerability of these cells to metabolic stress and maybe even a neurodegeneration. So that's something that we're actively uh, investigating. And so just to sum up everything I talked about today, um, so for the how question, I feel like we sort of understand the general logic of the circuit controlling sleep, even though there are a lot more details to be figured out. Um, for the why question, we understand uh, even less. Uh, we know that sleep interacts with a lot of biological processes within the brain and in the rest of the body. So for example, uh, in the brain, we know that um, sleep is important for uh, memory consolidation and learning and other aspects of mental health. Um, so for example, we know that sleep impairment is not only a symptom, but also a cause for disease progression in both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. So now we're actually part of the team to study sleep and Parkinson's disease. We also have projects in the lab looking at the interaction between sleep and the immune system and the neuroendocrine system, in particular growth hormone. And in fact, what we found so far is that the, both the immune system and the growth hormone axes have interesting interactions with the adrenergic system. So we think that it's quite possible that uh, shutting down or silencing of the adrenergic system 
is a basic step uh, during sleep that underlies uh, a variety of functions of sleep. So finally, these are the people in my lab who did all the work. Um, so I didn't talk about the data from these people, but these are the early pioneers in my lab. All of them are running their own labs now. Uh, Dan Chen is also running her own lab. She did the SNR study. Uh, Chen Yan and Yuan Yuan have both just got, gotten job offers. And we also have uh, many other uh, collaborators who helped us with various techniques. And thank you for your attention. I think I got perfect timing. Four seconds left. <laughs>